Thank you, choir. Beautiful song. And it fits in with what we're talking about this morning as we continue our uh, series on the different themes of Christmas. And today we're talking about love. And the key verse is John 3.16, which we all know. We said that uh, Christmas is the season of Advent. And Advent is simply a word that means coming. And uh, we talk about the coming of Jesus uh, the first time, and then we look forward to the coming again of Christ at the second coming, which uh, seems more and more to be closer and closer, doesn't it? But today we lit the fourth Advent candle, the love candle, and uh, we think of Christmas, we think that Christmas marks the entrance of love into the world. We had some hints of love, we had some ideas about love, but we have love fully manifested in the birth of the Lord Jesus, and we celebrate that at Christmas. Christmas is the ultimate expression of God's love for us. It's the expression of what God has done by sending his son into the world. And uh, we look at this verse, John 3.16, because... That's the verse that uh, most people associate with uh, what God has done for us in the sending of his son. And uh, it's been called the gospel in a nutshell. And it tells us everything we need to know about God's love, giving, faith, and eternal life. And so as we begin the service this morning, I want you to say this verse with me. There's many different translations of it. So if you can, read it. Uh, let's say the one together that's on the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the good news. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And it tells us all these wonderful things about God and love and about giving and faith and eternal life. And so we're going to look at that this morning and, and see how it relates uh, to Christmas because this is a wonderful verse to remind us of what Christmas is all about. First thing is that Christmas is about love, isn't it? Christmas is about love. And uh, you, you may not think of it in those terms, but when you think of what happens at Christmas, you see that it is a wonderful expression of love for others and God's wonderful expression of love toward us. We express love at Christmas, don't we? We gather with friends and we gather with family and uh, we share the excitement and the wonder of children as we remember the birth of the Christ child. And uh, the child in the manger, the celebration of angels and a mother's love are all wrapped up in this uh, Christmas uh, story that we celebrate each and every year. And, and we find out that God loved us and sent his son. As we just read, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And uh, that is why we celebrate Christmas, because it expresses to us this love that God has for us. But what kind of love are we talking about here? What kind of love are we talking about? Um, we as humans have an idea of what love is. We, we uh, begin to talk about human love and expressions of love. It's like uh, the woman who wrote to uh, Jimmy. Uh, she said, Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I've felt since breaking our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one can ever take your place in my heart, so please forgive me. I love you, I love you, I love you. Yours forever, Marie. P.S. Congratulations on winning the lottery. Now that's the world's idea of love, isn't it? That's the world's idea of love. Uh, there's always some conditions attached to it, but that's not what God's love is. God's love is something that is completely different. God's love is something that uh, is unconditional. And uh, 
there was a, a new tribes mission report that talked about um, a time they were doing some translation work there in Africa, and uh, they were trying to come up with with a word that expressed this unconditional love of God. And uh, the verbs for this particular African language always end in one of three vowels. Uh, they end with either an I, an A, or a U. But the word for love was only found with I and A. And the missionary was asking, why no U? And so he was with a translation team that had some of the leaders in the African tribe, and um, he was trying to understand uh, this concept of love because they had the concept in, in two of those words that uh, used the vowels, but the third one they didn't. And he was beginning to ask them, why, why do you have this difference? Explain to me. Uh, could you... Uh, Devi your wife, D-V-I. And the tribe leader said, yes, that would mean that the wife had been loved, but the love was gone. Well, the missionary asked, could you devay your wife, D-V-A? And they said, yes, that kind of love depends on the wife's actions. She would be loved as long as she remained faithful and took good care of her husband. And so the missionary asked the third question. Well, could you devue your wife, DVU? And all the people laughed in the room. And the missionary said, I don't understand. And they said, well, of course not. If you said that, you would have to keep loving your wife no matter what she did, even if she never got you water and never made your meals. Even if she committed adultery, you'd have to just keep on loving her. No, we, we would never say the view. It just doesn't exist in our language. And so the missionary sat there for a while thinking about our verse of the day, John 3.16. And he said, well, could God deview people? And all the tribes people got very silent for three or four minutes. And some of the elderly members began to cry. And finally, they responded by saying, do you know what this would mean? This would mean that God kept loving us over and over. Well, all that time, we rejected his great love. Uh, he would be compelled to love us even though we have sinned more than any people. And the missionary noted that changing one vow changed the meaning from, I love you based on what you do or who you are, to I love you based on who I am. I love you because of me and not because of you. And so the missionary concluded, God encoded the story of his unconditional love right into the African language. For centuries, the little word was there, unused, but available, grammatically correct and quite understandable. But they just didn't believe it about each other. But now they understood that that's the way God loved them, unconditionally. No condition set on the love that God gives to us because it depends on the character of God and not the way people respond or the way people act. You see, Christmas is about love, and love motivates us to give our best. Love motivates us to give our best. And when we come this Christmas season, I want you to remember that when you give gifts and you express love, remember it's a reflection of God's unconditional love for you and for me. But also, Christmas is about giving. Christmas is about giving. And uh, we think about Christmas, and the first thing that pops into our minds is gifts, especially if you're a child, you think about all the presents under the trees. Well, that's a tradition that, that has developed around the central theme of God giving. And that's what God did at Christmas. Christmas is about gifts and giving. And we give because God gave. We, we think of, uh, at Christmas time, the wise men, for instance, bringing their gifts to give to the newborn king. We sang that song uh, this morning, We Three Kings. 
And, and then we think of the, the wise men and also the shepherds uh, when they approached uh, the baby Jesus. What did they do? They, they worshipped him. They gave their worship and gratitude for God's gift to us all. And so gifts and giving are, are all part of this Christmas story. It's about giving. And in, in John 3.16 there, it says, For God so loved the world, that what did he do? He gave his one and only son. The greatest gift was God's gift. The greatest gift was God's gift. And, and he gave the very best gift. That was his one and only son. Uh, there's a graphic I saw this week on Facebook. It's a picture of Santa Claus kneeling down beside uh, the baby Jesus. Got that? I don't know if you can see it. I can't see it because the sun's so bright. But here's Santa Claus kneeling down at the manger. And, and I was touched by this picture because it reminds us that uh, we give gifts based on Santa Claus and, and Christmas presents and all these things. But where did that start? Where did it the idea come from. It, it comes from the idea that God gave his best gift. He gave his only son. So I think it's fitting that Santa has to bow to Jesus, don't you? And when we celebrate Christmas, we should always remember we celebrate not because of Santa Claus, not because of gifts that we find under the tree. We celebrate because God gave us his best gift, his one and only son. And we need to bow at the manger also, and allow God to have first place in our life, being grateful like the wise men and the shepherds were that God gave us his very best gift. But also, we find that God's love is sacrificial love. God's love is sacrificial love. We, we are called to love one another like Jesus did. So Jesus set the example. God set the example by giving his son, and then Jesus... Uh, set the example for us by giving his life. He gave his life so we might have life. And we're called to love one another like Jesus did. Notice what it says in 1 John 3.16. We have John 3.16, but there's a wonderful verse in 1 John 3.16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So how do we know what love is? Well, we look and see what Jesus did for us. He gave his life for us. He sacrificed his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for others. Uh, the old uh, Bible uh, teacher, James Denny, uh, gives an illustration of this, about what kind of love God gives to us. He says, if I was sitting at the end of a pier on a summer day, enjoying the sunshine and air, and someone came along and jumped into the water and got drowned just to prove his love for me, I, I would find that irrational, unintelligible. Why did he do that? I, I'm, I might be in need of love, but his act had no relationship to me at all. It was just something he did. It would be, it would be an, an act of self-destruction rather than an act of love. Why would he do that? But, he says, if I was at the pier and I suddenly slipped and fell off into the water and hit my head and I was beginning to drown and coming up for the third time and someone saw me and jumped off the pier into the water at great cost to themselves and they, they grabbed hold of me and saved me and brought me out of that water to the shore so I was saved that would be an act of great sacrificial love because that person was willing to die for me so I might live and that's what the scripture tells us that's what this verse tells us how do we know love that he laid down his life for us he laid down his life for us sacrificial love that's the kind of love God has for us and Jesus demonstrated that by giving his life for us. Why? Because we were drowning in sin. We were destined to death. And he's the one that came to rescue us. 
That's the kind of love God has for each and every one of us. And we can thank him and be grateful to him for his sacrificial love. And that's the way we're to live our lives. We're to give ourselves in service to others and to love one another because Jesus has set the example for us. You see, if you want to do something great this Christmas, if you want to give a really good gift, here's what you need to do. The best gift is serving others in Jesus' name. That's the best gift. Instead of thinking about uh, how, how wonderful a meal you're going to have on Christmas Day, maybe, just maybe, you'll, you'll prepare some plates and go down to the homeless shelter and give them some of that food too. You, you see, we're called to serve others in Jesus' name. Not just receive for ourselves, but to give as Jesus gave himself. So Christmas is about love, but it's also about giving. It's about giving. But finally, Christmas is about belief. Christmas is about belief. We could say Christmas is about faith, but, but uh, belief's a good word because it's used here in our verse, John 3.16. Uh, people believe in the Christmas spirit even if they don't believe in the Christ of Christmas. Um, heard, heard a song coming to church this morning, and uh, about what a wonderful season this is. And it went on and on about uh, why it's a wonderful season. Basically, it amounted to this wonderful cheer that's in the air and, and the singing and the, and the giving, and, and it was just a great time of year. It's the most wonderful time of the year, right? And people celebrate Christmas. They like that. They believe in the Christmas spirit, but they may not even believe in the Christ of Christmas. They like the atmosphere. They like what goes on at Christmas time. They, they, in other words, take to heart the message that the angels were singing. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. They like that. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. It sounds good. Why can't we do that all year round? We wonder why this same spirit can't last the whole year. Why, why won't it happen all year round? And so people like the Christmas spirit. They like the atmosphere, but they may not even believe in the one that Christmas celebrates. Well, Christmas is about faith. It's about putting your trust in the promised Messiah who was born in Bethlehem. And people might like the spirit of Christmas, but it all comes back to the reason why we have Christmas. And it's because we need to put our trust and faith in the Messiah, the one who was born in the manger. He was the promised Messiah. Many centuries before had predicted that he would come. And the people of Israel waited for his coming. But he, was, he surprised them by being born in in a manger stall, being born where they fed the animals, being born where the sheep and the cattle were kept. It wasn't something they expected, but that's what God did, have humble beginnings for the promised Messiah. And so when we think about Christmas, we think about saying, yes, I believe those promises. I believe God did send his son into the world, the promised Messiah who was born there in Bethlehem, just like it was predicted in Micah years before. John 3.16, in its completion, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's what Christmas is all about. God loves us. He gave his best gift for us. Now we need to respond. How do we respond? We respond in faith. We believe in him. We believe in him. And, and it becomes the decision between life everlasting or eternal death, perishing, outside, separated from God. And so the choice is very real. And, and the trust is very important. Who are you going to put your faith in? The spirit and atmosphere of Christmas or the one who came at Christmas? Are you going to put your trust in Jesus, the Messiah? Or are you going to reject him? Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is what Christmas is all about. That's what we need to do when we respond 
to Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. The great Anglican bishop, J.C. Ryle, said of those first seekers of truth, the, the wise men, he says, we read of no greater faith than this in all the Bible. It's a faith that deserves to be placed side by side with that of the penitent thief. The thief saw one dying the death of a malefactor and yet prayed to him and called him Lord. The wise men saw a newborn babe on the lap of a poor woman, and yet they worshipped him and confessed that he was the Christ. You see, they put their faith and trust in the King of kings and Lord of lords. Even though he was a little baby in a manger, they knew the promises had been given and that this was the Messiah. And so they worshipped him and bowed down before him. Henry Morehouse was a wild young man who at age 16 was a gambler, a gang leader, and a thief in England. But during the revival of 1859, uh, Henry gave his life to Jesus Christ. He became a Christian. And soon he was preaching. He would go out in the streets. He'd go everywhere he had an opportunity to preach, and he would preach the gospel with all his heart. And his favorite verse was John 3.16. Seems like every sermon he preached was John 3.16. One day in Ireland in 1867, uh, Morehouse met the famous evangelist D.L. Moody. And, and Henry had the nerve to say, when I'm in Chicago, I'm going to preach in your pulpit, Dr. Moody. Well, years later, Morehouse did come to America, and Moody was coming back from a trip and learned that Morehouse had shown up, started preaching, and was drawing great crowds at his church. And his wife said, he's preached two sermons from John 3.16, and I think you'll like him, although he preached a little different from what you do. Well, how's that? And his wife said, well, he tells sinners that God loves them. Well, Moody wasn't so sure about that, but that evening he went to hear Morehouse preach. And the young man stood up in the pulpit and said, If you'll turn to the third chapter of John, the 16th verse, you'll find my text. And Moody recalled, he preached the most extraordinary sermon from that verse. I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. This heart of mine began to thaw out, and I could not keep back the tears it was like news from a far country. I just drank it in. And night after night, Morehouse preached from John 3.16. And it had a life-changing effect on D.L. Moody. Moody said, I've never forgotten those nights. I've preached a different gospel since. I've had more power with God and man since then. Moody preached judgment. Morehouse preached love. Why? Because of John 3.16. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Morehouse fell ill several years later. He was on his own deathbed. He looked up and he told his friends, if it were the Lord's will to raise me again, I would like to preach from the text, God so loved the world. You see, that's what Christmas is all about. That's what Christmas is all about. That God loves us and gave his son for us. You see, God had a purpose in sending his son. He gave us Jesus so we could receive life. He, he gave, Jesus gave his life so we could receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. It, it's just an expression of God's heart, expression of God's character that he loves us. He gave us his very best gift. And then Jesus came and expressed who God was. That God is love. That God cares for us. He wants the best for us. He wants to forgive us. He wants us to be part of his family. And if you believe in him, the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 just sums it up very well. In this the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. That's the purpose. So we could have life. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means the one who covers and forgives 
the one who atones for our sins. He washes them all away. That's why Jesus came, to seek and to save the lost, to rescue us, and to give us forgiveness of sins. Now, you all heard Noah's testimony this morning as he was being baptized. And uh, Karen and I, a couple weekends ago, were, were talking to Noah. And, and out of the blue, Noah said, said uh, my other grandpa doesn't go to church. And I said, no, he's Hare Krishna. He goes to temple. And uh, Noah thought about that for a minute. And he says, well, doesn't, doesn't he believe in Jesus? And, and I, said, I said, well, your grandpa grew up Catholic, so he knows about Jesus. And uh, I'm sure he, he learned about Jesus when he was your age. And Noah said, well, I, I believe in God. I said, you do? I said, uh, do, you, do you know Jesus? Would you like to know Jesus in your heart? Would you like to receive forgiveness of sins? And Noah says, yes, Jesus forgives us of our sins. And I said, well, you can do that today, Noah, if you'd like to. Would you like to do that? And he said, yes, I would. And so Karen came over at that time, and we sat there and talked with him a little bit. And I said, would you like to pray and ask Jesus to come into your life? And Noah said, yes. And so I said, will you repeat after me? And so I led him through the sinner's prayer, and he asked Jesus to come in to his heart. Now, now Noah's, Noah's uh, seven years old, right? Six years old. Six years old. I was seven when I was saved. Noah was six years old. Karen was five when she was saved. And, and so, I, you know, you kind of wonder, does he fully understand? Well, it was one of the sleep overnights, so Noah slept overnight with us. Next morning we had breakfast, and he was half asleep because I had to get him up. And, and so we're sitting at the breakfast table, and, and Noah, said, Noah said, I feel different. I said, what do you mean, Noah? And he says, I feel different in my heart. He said, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And I thought, wow, that's a confirmation to Karen and I that Noah understood what he had done. And you say, well, is it real? Do, you, do kids really understand what they're doing? Well, the, this week, Andrew is going to fly in on Friday. And uh, Noah said, my daddy's coming in on Friday. I said, yep, and, and I hope he has good weather, and uh, I hope that uh, he can get here without any delays. And Noah said, well, I wish he can get here on time and be here for us. And I said, well, you don't need to wish. You just need to pray, Noah, and ask God to make sure that that your dad has a safe flight to get here into uh, Gainesville, and uh, you, you can see him on Friday. And Noah said, okay. Well, Sita was talking to him a little later, and, and uh, she said, kids, your dad's coming in Friday. And, and Noah says, yes, he's coming in Friday, and I'm going to pray. And he got down on his knees, and he prayed and asked God that his daddy would have a safe flight to get into Orlando so he could come home and be home. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You raise a kid in church, they hear the gospel from an early age, week after week after week, God's spirit works in their heart, they understand. They know who Jesus is, and they're willing to follow him. God help the parents and grandparents who refuse to bring their kids to church because they're not giving them a chance to hear the most important message in all the world. And parents and grandparents need to set the example for them because kids aren't dumb. They watch you. They watch me. And they know what you think is important and what you don't think is important. And if church is not important to you, it's not going to be important to them. And if they're not in church, they're not going to hear the good news. If they don't hear the good news, they're going to perish. They're going to perish. But if they hear the good news and they believe, they'll have life everlasting. You see, Christmas is the time to believe. Christmas is the time to believe. If there's any time in the year other than Easter that people should give their hearts to Jesus, 
It's Christmas time. You, you see, it's a time when you can believe that Messiah has been born. It, it's a time when you can believe that salvation has been given. It's a time to believe that we can have life that begins now and lasts forever. It's a time to believe that Jesus Christ is a Savior who forgives us and gives us peace with God. A man traveled a great distance for an interview with a distinguished scholar. And so he was ushered into the man's study, and, and the man said to him, Doctor, I notice the walls of your study are lined with books from ceiling to floor. No doubt you've read them all. I know you've written several yourself. You've traveled around the world extensively. You've, you've talked to wise people and scholars around the world. I, I've come a long way to ask you one question. Tell me, of all that you've learned, what is the one thing most worth knowing? And putting his hand on his guest's shoulder, the scholar replied with emotion in his voice, My dear sir, of all the things I've learned, only two are worth knowing. The first is, I'm a great sinner. And the second is, Jesus Christ is a great Savior. If you know those two things personally, you know the best news in the whole world. That a Savior has been born for you, who is Christ the Lord. Will you believe in God's love for you this Christmas? You have the opportunity, just like little Noah did, to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have an opportunity to bow at the manger and say, I believe you are the Messiah. And I give my heart and life to you, not because you're a little baby who's been born and we have nice sentiments, but because you grew up to be a man who walked with God and lived a perfect life. And you were the Son of God who gave your life on the cross for me so I could have forgiveness of sins. And God raised you from the grave, and I believe you have the power to give me eternal life. You can do that today by giving your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Won't you do that? What better gift could you receive than Jesus as your Savior? Let's pray together. Father, as we close this morning, our prayer is that each one here today will leave knowing without a shadow of doubt that Jesus is Lord and Savior of their lives. If there's one here that's never prayed to receive Jesus, one here who's never given their life to Christ, may this be the day they say yes to him and come and give their lives to him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to stand and sing together. You come. There's room at the cross for you.